recording. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Would like to call to order the Norfolk School Committee meeting for Wednesday, December 18th at 7.06 p.m. Um, as we begin all of our meetings, we begin with our mission statement. The Norfolk Public Schools offers a safe, joyful, and challenging learning environment that meets the needs of our diverse students. Through school, family, and community partnerships, we provide an education that inspires lifelong learners and cultivates, cultivates caring and productive citizens of our ever-changing world. Roll call. Mark Flaherty. Kelly Peterson. Sean Dooley. Ingrid Alardi. Okay. All right. As we do in the beginning with all of our meetings, we open up the floor to public comment. Um, would anyone like to say anything? All right. If, 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 if you could come up and go to a microphone there and introduce yourself and how you're re uh, related to the schools. Oh, there's one right there. Or wherever you want. You, you can sit down. You can sit in one of these little bitty chairs if you want. Teacher, if you end your meeting quick enough, you can go to the concert. It's fantastic. Oh, okay. Oh. I already suggested. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Thank oh, you. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I wouldn't have made you do all that. I thought you were actually, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought we were actually getting some public comment. <laughs> so, anything else? No? Okay. All right. Let's move on to correspondence. We have uh, donations. Um, we have received. $3,090.28 from the Norfolk TPA. Uh, $1,350 were the Reading A through Z renewal. Uh, I'm sorry, $850 was for that, and $500 was for the HOD playground for balls and equipment. Uh, and then over at, we had kindergarten math games for $180, grade one center games for $438.33, and reading books for $584.95. And then also an Adobe software license for $299 and a grade six red mic share for $238 for a grand total of $3,090.28. Is there a motion to accept? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And thank you very much to the Norfolk TPA who's continues to be just very, very do generous. I got a question. I'm wondering what uh, center games and red mic are. Uh, Red mic is a portable microphone they use. It's a sound system for the oh, classroom. Okay. And center games are probably different math games and things that can be used during small group instructional oh, time. All right. Cool. And th does the TPA does decide on what the money is used for? Many grants that teachers wrote requests for and they've agreed to fund. Oh, I see. Okay. That's how that works. Okay. So they just said, you're having this red mic whether you yeah. like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, chair report, okay. Uh, Massachusetts Educational Partnership presentation. Ta-da! Nancy Peace here from Mass Educational Partnerships to talk about um, the process of collaborative bargaining. And I don't know if the are, are you going to be, to we're, we're, okay, gonna we're, use so her. we'll go in the back. Now, do I need to have a microphone? Yes, uh, yes, if you could. Like we can get Mark will bring that one over for you. Well, <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. My name is Nancy Peace. I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Education Partnership. The partnership itself is a f um, primarily Gates funded, although we also have money from the um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and the National Education Association Foundation. So this is a two-year funded project, the mission of which is to improve student achievement through labor management collaboration. And just to show you, when we say it's a partnership, it is a partnership of these eight institutions. So it is the, the two teachers unions, the uh, School Superintendents Association, the School Committee Association, and then four research institutions. And, you know, um, s s studying what we do and studying outcomes is part of the goal of this, pro of this um, uh, project. Our programming and what we offer basically breaks down into two parts, and it is that we do interest-based collective bargaining, which is the reason I'm here tonight. We also have a separate project that's called the District Capacity Project, in which we're w working very deeply in seven different districts with the school committee and the uh, school, you know, uh, schools and the uh, union um, on a project of their choice. So in one district, they're actually working on trying to create a professional learning community in I can't off the top of my head remember what all the others are, but um, and those folks are working t 
two, over two years and have specific, specific funding to do that. And um, uh, so th that's the basic two parts. Okay. So here's our, our thing. I want to do it because I'm primarily here to talk about interest-based collective bargaining. Um, I just wanted to do a really, oops, really quick vocabulary so we all know what, we all have a shared vocabulary in terms of what I'm talking about. And how, can I just ask of both the, the teachers in the room and the school committee, have you all participated in collective bargaining before? Okay, some have, some haven't. So you haven't even had the tr experience of doing traditional bargaining. Okay. <laughs> well, in, in, in traditional bargaining, um, which we often call positional bargaining, uh, the parties come in and it essentially come in with positions. So the union will say, uh, let's just make one up. The union will come in and say, we want seven more minutes of prep time. And then the school committee might come in and first say no, and then you might bargain towards the middle and come up with three. Okay, so in traditional bargaining, you're often coming to the table with a proposal that in, in incorporates the, the uh, solution, or what you think is the solution to the problem. In this kind of bargaining, you, do, you are not coming to the table with a position, which is one party's solution to an issue. What you're coming to is um, trying to develop a, an understanding, a deep understanding of both your own interests around an issue and the other side's interests around an issue. And that's why it's called interest-based bargaining. And the reason to do that is because it allows you to have a much fuller understanding of what really is the issue, a much deeper understanding. But it's also a process that allows you to um, explore more fully all the options for resolving the problem. And that can be very important because if you think about the way I just described traditional bargaining, you start here and you march towards the middle. In, in an interest-based process, you, have a, you start out um, with a full exploration and then you can generate many more options to then meet those issues. So, and that's why I wanted to talk about uh, potential options that best meet both the party's needs and the concerns about an issue. And, and as part of the process, you, after discussing interests, would then jointly work on, on exploring options. For those of you who have a little bit of background in this kind of bargaining, some parties will call it win-win bargaining. I actually don't like that title. I think it sets up an unreasonable expectation, but it came out of the, of the book Getting to Yes back in the 80s, and so that's what people call it. Other, other folks you may hear referred to as mutual gains, interest-based bargaining. And so I like to just call about here's the way we bargain. And the training that we offer through the Massachusetts Education Partnership will essentially give you both the underlying theory about interest-based bargaining and some tools uh, to use it. And then you can design your own bargaining based on that education. We are not giving you a recipe. Some people come in and, and, and say, if you've just followed these six steps, you'll do IBB and it'll be a success. That's not the reality of the labor relations uh, world. And so what we prefer to do is give you a, you know, a set of principles, a set of skills uh, and tools, and then uh, work with you to develop your own bargaining. And so, the, uh, oh, and I have handouts if you want to follow along. I gave them to the teachers I put in the school. So here are some reasons why you might want to use interest-based bargaining. As I've already noted, it focuses on interests rather than positions and really opens up the conversation uh, between the parties and uh, often results in a much um, uh, uh, more appropriate uh, uh, re resolution of issues and problems. Frankly, it also opens up the relationship. One of the things that we find with parties doing interest-based bargaining is that they are able to work at the same time both on the substance of their agreement but also on their relationship. And from our point of view, you always want to optimize both. And that's particularly true in the field of education because you, know, you, you are all very uh, committed, my experience, both teachers and school committee people and administration um, are all committed to educating the students. And the, it seems to me that if you engage in a process which really allows you to uh, work jointly together, solve problems together, focus on the students together, um, it's a better outcome for all stakeholders, union, school committee, everybody. Okay. Also, our experience is that when parties get skilled at doing IBB, it'll, and you start to do it at the collective bargaining table, often it carries over in the day-to-day -day, uh, workings, that it becomes how you start to deal, how to think about or deal with a grievance or a problem. It's just a, a, a kind of disciplined approach to not go to the quickest, fastest answer, but to say, ah, oh, before we look for an answer, 
let's just figure out what the problem is and what are all the options for dealing with it. Now, one of the things also that's different about interest-based bargaining, if you're doing it properly, is that everybody has to come to the table prepared. In traditional collective bargaining, often the school board attorney and the MTA field person will come. We call them the talking heads. They will do all the talking, and all the rest of you just sit there like lumps. And if you want to have a conversation, you have to call a caucus, and then you go to separate rooms and talk. In an interest-based process, if it's done properly, Everybody is the table together. Everybody must be responsible to come in prepared. And the advantage of that is that you then have the full wisdom of everybody at the table contributing to the conversation and the solution um, of whatever issue is on the table. Uh, so that is a, it's a kind of a different approach. And as I've already noted, uh, if you do IBB, it tends to strengthen both your relationship and your capacity to work together. And it's interesting, and I've been doing this for probably 25 years now, and some parties come to IBB because they have a great relationship, but then find tr traditional bargaining will sometimes derail that for a while, and so they use this as a way to avoid derailing it. Other parties have come to it because they're having uh, both problems in their relationship, and, and, and that gets brought to the table, and this becomes a way of trying to repair the relationship. One of the questions I'm always asked is, well, how can you, you know, you've, do we have to have a high level of trust to do IBB? My response is, no, not necessarily. But what you do have to do then is to have clear agreements about how you're going to uh, work with each other at the table, um, how you're going to treat each other in terms of respect and, and, and so forth. If you make those agreements, if you stick to them, it will build trust. So I do find, I, I do find that IBB can be an avenue to building, even IBB within a collective bargaining context, a way to build the trust. But if you break those agreements, you'll be six steps back. <laughs> so this is a friend, a colleague I used to teach with, um, is very good at doing uh, fancy visuals. So I just thought I'd share this one with you. And what we're trying to show here is that if you focus just on positions, the obvious solutions to problems, that you're really just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Where if you engage in an interest-based process that really um, seeks to take the time to look at what are the underlying interests of the parties with respect to a particular issue, what are your underlying needs, concerns, hopes, fears, qualities around what you're trying to achieve and what the outcomes are, and what contingencies you need to think about as you develop a solution. That fuller conversation will result in a much more robust contract, more robust outcomes, and an ongoing relationship, uh, be good for your ongoing relationship. Again, IBB takes a very different approach to the whole bargaining process. So that, for example, I don't know how many of you have been in traditional bargaining, you've gotten into the battle, battle of the data. I'll bring my data, you bring your data, we'll argue. Um, in an interest-based process, the parties will some, or frequently uh, put together joint committees. So you might have one joint committee that goes and looks at information about what are comparable school districts or you know, whatever the issues may be. And one of the things we will do if you do training with us is actually have you look at your issues, then be, try to start to develop a bargaining schedule so that from when you start, you will know when you're going to end because you will have laid out a bargaining schedule. You will sometimes do things such as having, let's say there's an issue on the table with special education. Nobody at the table has that expertise. You will plan to bring in a couple people from, from your school school community who are experts. Not that you're going to turn them into negotiators, but you can draw on their skill and knowledge as you try to resolve a bargaining issue that may affect special ed. That's just an example. Okay. Um, so we do often have joint committees. We have uh, joint training is very, very important because um, my experience is that doing interest-based work is not in our culture the way people think about bargaining naturally. So it's counterintuitive. Just gonna have a little water here. Um, and so it's important that if you, you have joint training, so you all have a common understanding uh, of what it means to do interest-based bargaining. Okay. Um, in terms of the training that we offer, we offer eight hours initially of training, which, as I said, gives you the um, principles and some tools. At the end of that eight hours, we ask the parties to think about whether or not this makes sense for them. 
And I always describe our first day as a way to give you enough information to make an informed decision about whether or not you want to do interest-based bargaining. If you do, we then offer another eight hours of training, and, the, and it can be delivered either in you know, eight-hour segments or four-hour segments. So four fours or two eights, whichever works for you folks. Um, and that second eight hours does start to have you work on your ground rules, your bargaining plan, and if you are far enough along and know what your issues are, we will even start you maybe on an issue that um, you're going to have at the table anyway. So it's a way of easing the parties directly into, into bargaining from training, because sometimes um, if people just have training and then there's no transition, it, it's tough. Yes, I have a question. That's great. That's great. Great. So I mean, I don't. I I just don't like eight hours necessary if we're already full sides, you know, used to kind of working that way and um, you know, do we need the full eight hours to I would encourage you to do it. I, I, um, I'm not, I, I still would encourage you to do it. Um, it. I mean, I agree with you that it, I've, I've drawn the traditional bargain IBB as sort of the two extremes, and in reality, parties are all often along a continuum. Nevertheless, I think that the training itself will be very useful, especially if you've got a couple of people who haven't been at the table um, before. And so that first day gives you a chance to, um, I'll, get to, I'll show you what the curriculum is about in just a sec. It'll give you a chance to look at your past bargaining, look at what, 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 what you've done well, what might have been challenges, look at your communications, and then start to do the interest-based theory. So, I mean, I, I, yes, I would, well, I would say it's well worth doing. Um, and, um, all right, let me see if I can get that. So that, just, I can go back to that other one in a minute. So that's what our, our day looks like. On um, day one, we have a reflection on past bargaining. We have a lot of work on communication skills. And, and then the introduction to the IBB principles and tools. Then day two would be the ground rules. Um, and we also encourage parties to do an exit agreement. Um, because that way, if you start to, f and, and most people never use it, but it's the kind of thing we say, better to talk about it now when you haven't started and there's no tension than when, if you find yourselves getting in trouble further down the road. Because among the things you need to think about is if we're using an interest-based process and we've got a certain amount of tentative agreements, um, it may be that a lot of the tentative agreements we've reached have favored one side or the other just because they were easier. And so do those all stand or do they all go away? It almost doesn't matter what you agree. It only matters that you have an agreement. So that um, it doesn't, this doesn't, leaving the process doesn't become um, a source of tension. Uh, my experience is people can use IBB all the way through, even for distributed issues like money. However, some parties find when they get to the money, they don't, they're not comfortable, and they just by mutual agreement go back to sort of making offer and counteroffer. But if you've got done good joint data work, you tend to know the range of settlement even on the money, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Now that other one I skipped over, this is kind of a three-tier model of how we think about collective bargaining. And so while it's true that you're going to be sitting at the table, you're going to be working at the collective bargaining level, the issues you're going to be discussing are ones that arise from the workplace level. And so you, they, you know, there's a great deal of interaction there. It is also the case, however, that you are operating in a larger universe. And so at the strategic level, there are issues of um, all the mandates coming down from the federal government and the state government, whatever the tax situation may be in your community and the resources, uh, whatever issues may be going on within, uh, within uh, your statewide union. So there is a strategic level that also affects what it is you are doing at the collective bargaining level and frankly even the workplace level. And that's why we have that little, that model, we think, I think helps to explain it. Um, one of, sometimes people will ask me, does um, doing IBB take more time than traditional bargaining? And my experience is that not if you do it in a disciplined way. And sometimes if parties really get stuck, they can take longer doing traditional bargaining because they just spend a lot of time spinning their wheels. Um, 
And when I first started doing this many, many years ago, I worked in the town of uh, Sudbury, and I've written about them so I can talk about them. And um, I trained them in December. They were the only group in Sudbury that year that got, was done by town meeting with 25 issues. And of those 25 issues, three or four of them were issues they had never been able to resolve during regular bargaining. Uh, while back in my own hometown of Warwick, Rhode Island, they'd been four years without an agreement using traditional bargaining. So um, I don't buy that IBB has to take longer. I do buy that everybody must come in prepared and everybody must contribute, okay? Okay, so this is our vision, the MEP vision for what we're trying to do. I won't read it to you, it's in your handouts and up there. And that's essentially, whoops, back, um, where I wanted to end because I wanted enough time for questions. I also want to say to you that the website is on, I hope, on my handout. It's www.massedpartnership.org. Uh, and um, there's a lot of materials there about interest-based bargaining. There's some videos. I just actually did an interview of the president of the uh, Franklin Teachers Union. In Franklin, they've used IBB across the whole school district. So not only the teachers, but cafeteria workers, paraprofessionals, whatever. We've trained five different units there. And um, they, so they have wall to wall. And the president speaks very articulately about it, but he also talks about the school committee's, uh, uh, like an insight at one point that the school committee had. In that case, it was about the cafeteria workers, but I think it's an interesting one. Um, and then there's another one from Illinois that we uh, recorded many years ago. Uh, where two of the administrators and the union president are talking about their experience. So I think those will just be helpful if you have questions. So I'm just going to stop there and um, ask if anybody has questions. Mm. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's, what's the cost breakdown on this campaign? If you take training with us, it's 16 hours of free training. Okay. After that, um, if the parties want to use external uh, uh, facilitators, um, which is um, what some, quite a few parties have done. Most of the folks who do the facilitation uh, bill at $150 an hour. Frankly, that's what we pay them as well. But a lot of other parties have found that they can use internal facilitators, and there's been various models of that. In Sudbury, the example I just gave you, the uh, school board attorney and the MTA rep Ellen Suarez and Virginia Tate just took turns. Uh, one would facilitate one, one evening and the other would take notes and then they would flip. And that worked out very well for them. In another school district, not one I trained, but um, one of my colleagues trained, they just, there was somebody within the school system that both sides trusted, that they just was known to be a great facilitator. Um, that she, he or she, I can't remember now, came to the training so they understood IBB, but they just used an internal facilitator. Um, so, uh, it, it just depends on what your model you use and your resources. Um, I've worked in situations where the parties did not use a facilitator for a lot of the issues, or they did internal, and then they got stuck on a couple issues and I came back just one night. Um, in this case, I wouldn't come back, but somebody would. Um, so you could also just use a paid facilitator, external facilitator, you know, kind of an as, an ad need, uh, as needed basis. So I think there are lots of models. I would not let that um, stop you from doing it. Um, and let's, I had one other thought that just went right out of my head. All right, any other questions? Um, you were, yeah. You were saying at the beginning that um, are, it, are you talking about the training or the beginning of the collaboration um, and, and bargaining that we, everyone comes with a certain level of homework already completed? Well, it would depend on the issue. So let's, you know, the on the first day or two of your bargaining normally, you would start to lay out your issues, right? Each side's going to, you, you have homework before you ever come to the table, even in traditional bargaining. What is it we want to talk about? You know, what are our concerns? What we would encourage you to do is don't come to the table with positions. Come to the table trying to be as articulate as you can about why you need certain things and what your hopes are for the outcome of the bargaining. Um, and then create a bargaining schedule about kind of what order you're going to talk about things in. Then take a look at what kind of information do we even have? What do we need to have an intelligent conversation about this? That's where the homework comes in. And that's where you also decide, are you going to have joint committees or not? Perhaps we need a joint committee on gathering data about, um, I don't know, uh, teacher salaries in comparable districts or uh, planning time in different districts, whatever the issues may be, I don't want to. Uh, presume that I know what your issues are. Right, so yeah. Once, that's, that's if you 
you can address right. the issues and concerns of approach and create the training schedule on that. Everyone, yes. Right? And three ways we're going to be dealing with this. Right. Take you with you for your homework. Exactly. Because, you know, they might have an issue that you know, we haven't anticipated and vice versa. Oh, absolutely. You don't, and, and you know, you would have an initial conversation. We, if, if they had an issue you hadn't heard of yet, or hadn't thought about, then I would expect this union to sort of say, here's, here's the need, here's, what, here's why we're bringing it, here's what we see, and um, that would give you, t and then after that, you could say, well, maybe before we actually have a discussion, we need some more information. You'd be amazed at how often you actually need more information, if you stop to think about it, okay? One of the other things we'll try to, we try to do in our training is that you will all become process consultants. And let me explain what I mean by that. I spent years being a labor mediator, okay? When I work with you as a mediator, about half of my brain is really concentrating on your, the substance of what you're trying to achieve. But the other half is always attending to how the parties are interacting. What is it about the way that we are working that either is moving us forward or getting in the way? And you will get to have a second instinct about that as a group. And it's a good skill to have, um, both for bargaining and in general. Okay, so that's just a side of something I think is useful in terms of the training. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. Sure. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you could point out some of the disadvantages of some of the experiences you had that it didn't work that you may want to be aware of. Okay, I've had only a couple that didn't work. And, um, and I've done many, over many years. And in both cases, I knew in the training they weren't going to work. One was a situation in which, not the school committee chair, but the chair of the bargaining committee, the school committee had a separate bargaining committee, was a litigating attorney, a litigator. And I could see in his eyes that everything I was saying, he lived in an up, uh, you know, I'm up, you're down world. Or, you know, my, uh, the, my goal is to get as much of the pie as I can. I could see in his eyes that what I was saying was not making any sense. So I pulled the, the MTA rep and the school committee chair and their lawyer out and I said, I really think you should stop this training. I don't think this is going to work here. No, 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 they wanted to do it. And unfortunately, I was right, it did not work there. And, and, it was, and, and in another situation, I had a superintendent who I could see was not buying, to, uh, buying into it. Um, in that case, actually, the superintendent was in the process of leaving and I think was an agent for destabilizing it. But of all the ones I've trained, those are the only two that haven't worked. Now, there have been others. Um, that's why the, the, mostly the ones that don't work are where the people haven't had training and where they haven't developed a joint understanding of what is it we are doing here. What do we mean by IBB? What does it look like? I mean, that's the recipe for disaster. Um, now, some of the uh, school board attorneys do have a resistance or a fear, but not all, I have to say, um, that somehow if the parties engage in IBB and, and, and the school board and the teachers have these really deep, great conversations, that the school board will somehow naively bargain away uh, rights that it has under 150E. But I don't think that's necessarily a given. And um, in fact, I know it's not a given. And so, you know, but it is a conversation you should have with your own attorney, because I, I, I assume the school board, I, I've heard the school board, I ask the teachers you know, who comes to the table, and I understand you do use an attorney. I think it's a conversation you need to have. Um, I will tell you that my experience has been in school, in school in situations in which there's been a difficult relationship and a lot of grievances, that the number of grievances tends to go down dramatically if the IBB collective bargaining is successful. Um, so those are the examples I can think of. Yep. At the end, you know, both sides before anything signed takes it to their you know, then take it to the director and we'll take it to our right. and make sure all that is done and he's crossing it through something where Absolutely. Yeah. And, and remember, come by I know, you've both got a fiduciary responsibility to your constituents and a legal responsibility. And that in no way goes away. And this is also not easy. I mean, some people um, th will say, oh, you know, this is just soft bargaining. Well, you know what? It's not so If you're doing it right, it is not soft bargaining. It is also true early on when IBB first came to be used in collective bargaining. Some parties got so thrilled that they were actually talking to each other and having dinner, and it was so nice not to be fighting, 
but they never reached agreement. You know, and, and that's no good either. <laughs> You've got to get a contract, which is one of the reasons why we like to have a very disciplined approach to how you plan your bargaining. And that's the one thing a facilitator can help you with if you're using a facilitator, but if you're not, you've got to do it for yourself. Stay on track. You know, keep work, work an issue. If you need more information, put it aside, go get that information, come back, but be aware that you've got to get a contract. And the sooner the better. But not at the cost of a, a terrible contract. <laughs> um, so, all right. Okay, and I've, I've, there's a, 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 in the packet I gave you, there's just a short article I wrote for the uh, Labor and Employment Research uh, Relations Association that we can, it describes a little bit more about what it might look like. Okay? Well, thank you. If we can get Lisa and Cheryl to talk about their Boston partner, because they have oh, to get back yeah. to end the concert. Well, see, if we keep them here, then we'll get to go to the end of the concert, because they can't end the concert unless Lisa's there, right? <laughs> Is that how that works? Yeah. You, you basically have the car keys. No one can leave without you. Um, all right, so we're going we're gonna to skip over the uh, DECA project and go to the regionals. Um, let's see, where, where's Lisa on here? The She's Norfolk right Public Schools partner uh, application from Boston College. Uh, um, You've got to come to the table if you and Cheryl join the end, just because you need to be on the mic. And, and yep. I was going to say Mark doesn't bite, but he actually does. Do? <laughs> Only if you enjoy it. <laughs> oh. I'm all set. Thank I, you. <laughs> I, I, I did that to myself, didn't I? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, about well, it's probably two years ago. Um, Dr. Julie McAvoy from Boston College reached out to myself and Cheryl and let us know about a friendship project that they were doing through their graduate program at Boston College and with their graduate students. And at that time, we were just about ready to move um, into the new building. And I asked her if we could put that off for a year because there was no way that we could take this project on too. So, most recently, Dr. McAvoy came back and met with Cheryl and I in regards to being more specific of what type of research project they were doing at Boston College. And it entailed a friendship project. And what that entailed was her coming to our school and actually working with um, different um, people. So our teachers, our parents, and our school faculty. And what they were going to do first is, is they were going to actually see what types of friendships our students have within our school body, how they actually approach friendships, what are some of the strong points about our students' friendships, and what are some of the areas that, you know, what students struggle with actually in everyday life, out on the playground, within their classrooms, um, things of that nature. So what that would entail was uh, Dr. McAvoy coming to our school and actually with her graduate students and having students um, fill out surveys. And before that, the parents have the option to actually opt out of this if they don't want to. All the data is secure. It is not, you know, given to anybody. We only receive, we, we don't see the questionnaires, we only see the feedback that's given to us on the data. And that data would actually be shared at um, faculty meetings. Um, and then they would come back and actually do some training with actually some classroom teachers, with the whole faculty, with parents in regards to, you know, what, what's working well and what's not. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, Cheryl. I don't know if you want to add anything else. Um, they've done the study in other schools with success um, in Massachusetts and other parts of the country. Yeah, yeah too, so. quite a bit. And the student surveys, the students' names are not attached to them. They're no anonymous names, it's, surveys it's anonymous. With impressions about friendship issues, challenges, right. problem solving. Every and child the data is reported only in ag aggregate in terms of trends, but right. no individual student is identified nope. by their responses. Their name is on their first when they take the survey, but then Boston College removes the name and assigns a number, and then that information gets shredded. Um, when, when does this take place during the day? 
this, they come out and actually we would assign, um, we have actually built into our schedule open circle time. We have, um, you know, our mock curriculum, things of that nature. So they would come in during one of those periods, actually they need to come in three times. So they would come in and we would schedule, Cheryl and I would schedule for the teachers when they would come in. And actually Cheryl and I would be in the classroom when they were administering it. They read it question by question. They have more than one facilitator in the classroom. Um, and then after they do the three visits, then we get the data. We actually get data after two and two. then they'll come back with after the third to give us the final. Anyone else have questions? I think the value, one of the it's values bit, yeah. in it is that we get good um, information about how we're doing in terms of the anti-bullying curriculum, the program supporting kids. We know that it's critical for kids to make good, form good, solid, lasting friendships, and that impacts many areas of their lives. So right. they will give us information, and then they'll also give us strategies to help us um, enrich those friendships and strengthen our programming. And they'll provide professional development for yep. and parent, parent workshops. workshops, you know, teachers. teacher workshops. Um, us as um, you know administrators so so that's why I suggested to Lisa that they actually apply as partners because it's more than just this project they're offering to partner around parent needs and um, you know staff training and one of the things that I had asked Dr. McAvoy because it, it was a, it was a year project that they would be doing but one of my curiosities was once we receive the data and they give us suggestions in regards to what can we do to improve things around here and then we actually implement those improvements does she ever stay around for a second year to see how things are going and then go back to actually do that so she was going to go back to Boston College and actually talk to um, some of her advisors and actually think about doing that and applying for, for more money because I feel there's a lot of value but you know what just one year I'd like to see it actually stretch so that we can see some of the improvements you know right. so um, is the goal of this research on their end or is it more for um, it, consulting after the fact I'm a little confused at this I, I think I it's, it both. Was a it's both study. Yeah. it's it's a research study for them to help right. them understand trends in in children's development of friendships yes. and then to be able to put together programming and supports for districts and improving them so it is both there's a research piece and then there's a practical piece. Just like we have a program for our social competency that we use and we have a program for our bullying prevention. This would be another one to looking at, you know, and a lot of kids, and Cheryl can speak more to this than I can, but a lot of kids have difficulty on the playground in regards to friendships and forming friendships and keeping friendships and things of that nature. So we really feel that benefits you know, us in many ways. And there's really no actual curriculum that's written for friendships at this point. Like we have Open Circle and there's other resources, but she's really doing a lot of this research with the goal of maybe eventually creating a friendship-based mm -hmm. curriculum because there's nothing at this point with research, uh, research based to that. So that's, I think, where her long-term vision is with a lot of this research. Well, I think it sounds like a good, uh, a friendship based curriculum might sound like a good idea but unfortunately you get so many different types of kids and so many different I mean honestly I I tended to be a very shy kid mm -hmm. I still tend to be a very shy although it might not show sometimes uh, but uh, you know and no amount of education is going to educate that out of kids and then you got the kids are so uh, I guess the best word I can use is finicky you know where a friendship can break up, break apart because uh, Joey decided he liked the same girl that Bobby liked, and all of a sudden now they're not talking. And you know, it's just. I don't, and I also don't know if I like the idea of using the students as part of a research project because that's primarily what I, when I read this, what I got out of it. You know, and I do like that the parents can opt out, mm -hmm. but you also got the fact that. I think even if the parents don't opt out, a lot of you know, probably a lot of kids, at least at least when I was a kid, I would say, wouldn't take it seriously. They, you know, it's just we got surveys when I was in school all the time, and you know we just filled out whatever we wanted. It didn't, it didn't matter. Yeah, they don't give the surveys just to the kids and walk away. Though one of the things that they do is that they're pretty actually concrete, and they actually walk through step by step, and they actually read the question and they read the the choices to every single kid. And I can hear what you're saying in regards to, you know, what there's a concern about actually you using students as a study, but I feel like that we can 
benefit largely, you know what, to help students, and it's a toolbox for us actually, and for teachers that they're, they're going to provide us strategies on what we can do when a situation like that may happen. And the surveys are built so that if somebody is just checking boxes off, it'll show up that that's not a valid survey. I, I personally, I mean, I, I have my concerns with it as well, just from the standpoint that it's predominantly a research, um, and you know, using using our children from that standpoint. I think I would be much more comfortable personally with, if it was an opt-in program, as opposed to an opt-out. Um, from the standpoint of that way, parents are uh, are informed and are making an informed decision to allow their children to take part of it, as opposed to it's one of the 50 pieces of paper they get in a, in a week, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, whatever. It's a you know friendship thing, you know, next because they've got 50, you know mm -hmm. 20 other things going on in their minds. So I, I would be. They have to um, opt in or out, and the student also has to agree. So not only do you need parent permission, yes or no, but the student has to agree as well. Would there okay. be a way where? Does that answer your question? Mr. Well, I was going to say, well, I was going to say, I mean, I would, you know, as, as long as, and I and I guess the follow-up to to that point is, you know, if you have, you know. Just to make my math easy, 50% of the students opt in, the other 50% do not opt in. Um, and I think it needs to be proactive that they're actually f opting in, not, a, you know, not an opt-out option. Um, you know, that they actually have to take the step to get into the program, I think, is, 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 is important. Um, but if they're observing relationships throughout the playground and things along those lines, how are you going to identify, you know, which children are they're observing? Which children are, are being, you know, I mean, I don't if, think there's, there's no observation. No there's no observation. It's just a couple of surveys. Yeah, just the surveys. It's yeah. just the just surveys. Just That's it. Surveys. There's just two surveys, and then there's a third one. Right. Like and I can give you an example of what a. Yeah, can you give me an yep, example? I can of give you the an Yep. So this is version A. This is a practice one. One day, your friend comes over to eat dinner at your house. You are really excited because your parents ordered pizza. Toward the end of the dinner, there's only one piece of pizza left, and you really want it because you're really still hungry. Your friend reaches first for the pizza, though. How would you feel if this really happened to you? One, I would feel angry. One, not at all. Two, three, four, five a lot. I would say it's my house. What would, you, what would your goal be in this situation? I would be trying to get back at my friend. One, really disagree. Two, somewhat disagree. Three, five, really agree. Let me walk step by step through with them. It's another one. You're having a really hard time in your math class, and if you don't get a good grade on your next test, you might end up failing the class. Your friend is really good in math and always gets good grades. So you ask your friend to help you study for the next math test, but your friend says no. How would you feel if this really happened to you? I would feel sad, not at all, and then it goes to five, a lot. I would feel angry, not at all, a lot. What would you say or do in this situation? I would find a way to work things out with my friend. One, I really disagree, to five, really agree. I would tell my friend that he or she is a jerk. One, I really disagree, five, I agree. Okay, so so I, I guess to, to clarify, so they basically come in, you know, during the open circle time. Mm -hmm. One person says, "This is what we're doing." Mm -hmm. One is really agree. Five is strongly disagree. Take the test, mm -hmm. then that's it. That's it. And then it goes back. And then it goes then, back, and they score, and then they provide us with the data. And so they're looking to see where our kids' strengths in, in terms of negotiating conflict, what things are they worried about, what strategies do they have so they can develop a curriculum that will help us prepare kids with those skills that they're, they're lacking. Right. And then they do a second survey. They do. Um, to kind of assess the progress there. Yep. It's like a, it's and, a and follow -up. But there's no observation. And, 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 and are the surveys linked per grade level, per classroom, per? They're, or, all, the it, they're it, all the same. So we're using the same one, three, four, five, and six. But, but so, so when, they're, when they're scoring it, they're just taking 500 scores. Well, they'll know what third grade, so they'll look at third grade as a okay, whole. That's what, that's what I want yes. to know. If they'll look at fourth grade as a whole. Yeah. You know, they'll probably put 3A, 3B, 3C, so that they could go back to a teacher and they could say, Sean, you know what, okay, here's what I really noticed about the 30 kids in your class. Here's some things that you might be able to teach, actually, during open mm -hmm. circle time. So we'll get the information by whole, whole school-wide. We'll get it by grade, and it can break down by classroom by classroom. Yeah, they might, so they can break it up layer. female, male, 
as well in the grade level. Is there a facilitator with each of the students? Yes, so there's the Dr. McAvoy comes and she probably brings four or five of her graduate students. So they're all in that classroom so it's at the one same on time. One. One, one of the facilitators is walking one individual student through the survey. No, 25, 25, kids, 25 kids at a time, right. and the facilitator is at the front of the classroom, and they read the question. Like the students follow along, and the assistants are actually walking through to make sure the kids okay. are on the That's right question. I got you. you okay. see, I would be curious, though, especially if we're going to ask the parents to opt into a, a program like this for their kids, if the parents are going to want to get, I would like to see some kind of presentation from this uh, person. Well, I think that's what they they said well, either to do it afterwards, but I think beforehand as well. I think is right. Doctor McAvoy yeah. would be happy to come out I, I to talk to you guys. Parents would like you know. If, I would think if a parent's going to opt into a program like this, no matter how innocuous it sounds, and it does seem like it's pretty innocuous. I think that's the right word. Am I using the right word? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, I'm trying to use big words to make myself sound educated. <laughs> that they're going to want to actually listen to the doctor herself speak and you know and maybe have some questions themselves that they would be happy to come back in January and give you a PowerPoint yeah. presentation and I think to I would maybe like Lisa to do we that. would think about I mean if the committee supports the partnership she had originally put together an informational letter that explained mm -hmm. what was involved and then there is a that you have to choose I would like my child to participate or not so you have to you have to make a conscious okay, choice um, and then we could have an informational session for parents that want more information and actually have her come in so maybe we could send the literature out have a date where she's coming to respond to questions and then have the forms due after that yep. and then and then there's a parental workshop at the end yes. as well yes. Yes. on how to help your child help your sustain child. friendships these are, these are based on right. Okay. Right. Yeah. one of the things that might happen now because it's a little bit late is is this may carry over until next year right i think i personally i'd like to actually have the presentation from her and let the parents get their questions and feedback in before we decide on agreeing to uh, the partnership I think the only problem with that is I don't, I don't want to waste her time. And if we're not going to do it, we shouldn't do it. I mean, I don't want to have, right, and I also don't want to waste parents' time that if, we're, if we put it out there, I don't want to have the parents, you know, I mean, how are we going to then determine from that, you know, some of the parents liked it, some of the parents didn't. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to put us. I'm not saying that, uh, I don't know if I'm wording it right. I mean, I'm not going to say we're going to say we're not, I don't want to say we're not going to do this, or we're, but I'd like to get, the parents' feedback on before. I don't want to tell her that yes, we're going to go. We want to do this, and then later on, when the parents go, look, we don't like this idea, and then we have to say, oh, I'm sorry, we're not going to do this well, now. It, it's always within our authority yeah. that if 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 you know she presents it like this, and then goes be, be toward the the parents and presents a completely different program or something that's much more intrusive and things along those lines and the, all of a sudden we get an outcry from the parents that went to that meeting and said this is horrible we can say you know what done you know, we, we, we'll call an emergency session and and and, and you know she's out and, you know just because we give her the ability to do it doesn't mean she has you know she, she's still she's still at our at our at our will I mean from that standpoint I mean, and I think Mark too if you if you had a presentation and she presented to parents then, and if parents weren't in favor of it and didn't sign up, they're not going to want to partner with us if they don't have a good research base. Um, you know, I've heard from a lot of parents and a lot of families, especially in light of some of the school-based emergencies that we've heard of lately, what are you doing around bullying? What are you doing around friendships? Um, and there is a, a research void in this area. So, you know, I think that there would be quite a bit of parent interest, um, but if, if she presented and we sent out forms and they didn't have a lot of parents opting in, they would not want to participate. Right. They need a good, broad research base for it to be valuable for them. The other thing that I can do, too, is I can reach out to the Massachusetts. She's done schools very close districts in the yes, area, so, um, yeah. Um, I can reach out to the principals and superintendents there that they did the project and see, you know, what, how it went as well. So is there any further discussion, any questions? Thomas, Kelly? How, how are you going to, obviously the child, if he doesn't feel comfortable taking the survey, how are you going to handle that during the circle time? We, they wouldn't have to be in the classroom when they were taking the survey. We would provide another opportunity for something for them to do during that time. As you said, both the child and the parents have to opt in. Correct. Yes.
What are you thinking, Kelly? You look, I'm you're, just thinking you're, that, <laughs> that, that allowing a, a somebody that young to opt <laughs> into something they have no idea what it is, that's, that's really not. The teachers have conversations yeah. with their classrooms in regards to what it is at their age level developmentally appropriate as well. So Dr. McAvoy comes in just, just to briefly, you know, a 10 mm -hmm. minute quick conversation with the classroom to talk about it and explain it to them as well. Okay. So even before they take the survey, she comes in just to do, you know, this is who I am, these are who my graduate students are, and gives the students an overview of what they're going to be doing. She just has to get their opt-in just because it's research and just to mm -hmm. ensure that they are aware, you know, of what they're doing and they're mm -hmm. participating. Mm -hmm. uh, have we got any feedback on the parents? Because uh, I remember getting this sheet oh, we did. months ago. What, yes. what kind of response rate I've or what kind of responses have we received? We got all a big majority big positive. positive, yes. Majority positive? Very few no's. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is there a motion to accept the... Julie P. McAvoy, PhD, Boston College, application for a school partnership, which will in turn allow her to take the next step of doing the, this research project. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Me. I just, I, I don't, I just don't feel comfortable, you know, with just... Yes or I mean, no, yes or no, yes no. or no, no. Okay, so three to one. Okay, passes. All Thank right. Thank you very much. All right, go back and close, your, close your show. <laughs> <laughs> Is it about to end? Do we take a do we do we take a break for the I final? Take I do think session. you should take a break. It is really incredible. It's right. amazing. Right. It is amazing. So I do think we're we're, we're going to take a five to ten minute recess now that Donna's here. It's uh, <laughs> we have two Donnas now in the audience, so it's we've we reached our maximum all, Donna allowance. So, all right. <laughs> so we got. If you're quick, you huh? Isn't it horrible? Like, oh, I know it's absolutely horrible. And we're back. Thank you very much. All right, let's see. Where are we? We've kind of bounced around a little bit tonight. We're at the Donna Decker gave project. me a bunch of stuff. All right. Uh, the um, oh, we needed to um, approve the uh, King Philip Decca. Um, uh, has a, the King Philip students have a DECA project this year which um, collecting uh, care packages for soldiers. So shampoo, soaps, um, toothpaste, snacks, things along those lines. Everything that they can pack up and send overseas for the, um, the soldiers in, um, you know, around, uh, for our soldiers around the globe, um, you know, just to make their lives a little bit easier. And so we need a motion to um, allow them to um, send home information to collect um, these items for the, for the care packages. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And finally on my report, uh, the Regional School Committee Chair Men's Meeting, we had on, on Monday night um, myself, the chair of the Rentham School Committee, the Plainville School Committee, and the KP School Committee, um, we all met um, to discuss ways to be more collaborative, work together to um, make sure all of our um, curriculums are, you know, are coordinated with the common goal of making sure when the kids enter into seventh grade, into, enter, go from the K through six district into the KP district, that we're all bringing them there with the same level as much as possible of education. Um, make sure that we're not using one math program that is completely opposite, you know, the other two districts. So, you know, when the, t when the seventh grade teacher is trying to teach, you know, math, it's, it's relatively seamless. They're all basically starting on the same page, at least on the level of, you know, the type of curriculum that's involved. Um, in addition, work with each other to do more shared services. Um, Rentham and Plainville uh, do a very good job of sharing services on the um, food service. They have, a, uh, they have a combined food service director. They're able to buy, buy food in, in a larger bulk because they're two school districts as opposed, as opposed to I mean, one, one big school district as opposed to two small school districts. So those sort of things, and I joked with them, I'm like, oh, maybe we can get involved in that. And they're like, well, you know, let's, you know, kind of uh, go, go one thing at a time. Um, so it was a very, very productive meeting. Um, what we anticipate the next step to being in, um, you know, probably have one more and then also have a joint 
school committee meeting. I, I, I'm not necessarily a fond of this, fond of this because it's um, roughly 20 people, but it'll be, I think it'll be act more as a get to know each other round table, more of a retreat sort of situation as opposed to a meeting where you're actually deciding anything just so everyone knows who the players are, you can put a face with a name, and just kind of discuss some general overall issues. Um, I think it was, um, it was good from the standpoint of there's often an us versus them on the K-6 versus the KP, especially because of how we get pitted against each other from a budget standpoint. Um, but then there's also a certain you know, level of, um, I, I want to say animosity is the right word, but we just don't work together with the other, other districts, uh, you know, other K through six districts in the area, um, you know, far as sharing you know, ideas and resources, you know, not so much you know, even, even services, but just be able to come together and say, you know, all right, this is you know, what we were able to, you know, here was a problem that we had, this is how we were able to solve it, and this is why. And by having the relationship of the school committees being able to work together, I think that's the end goal, that we have another partner you know, one town away that we can say, all right, we have, you know, same kids, our kids all end up in the same high school system. You know, how did you handle this X, Y, Z issue? Um, and so, you know, or if we have a very great success with our, you know, safety and security systems that we're putting in, we can say, hey, just so you guys know, we did this, this, and this. We got a rave reviews. It worked great for the students. It worked great for the teachers. Just so you know, you might want to try this. So I think having that, um, thought sharing process could be very, very uh, beneficial. So that's, you know, this was just the very first, you know, hour and a half, just kind of touchy-feely, get to know each other. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, no, nothing, no decisions were made. It's always nicer when you're, you know, you're hanging around having some apps and a beer at the Eagle Brook discussing these things. It makes it a little bit easier. Um, and uh, so I think that, I think it's a, a good first step. And I think it's definitely overdue in this district. Any questions on it or any comments? Mm -mm. I think doing a retreat with all the uh, school committee uh, so would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. So bounce ideas off of each other, come up with things we never thought of, you know? Right. You know, and I think just having, you know, one of the things I've found in the, in, in the clerk's world, it's just nice having other people that have been in your job and, you know, done it at you know, different times to be able to call and say, hey, you know, we had this issue, you know, you and I hit it off at this school committee meeting, you know, what do you think of this? You know, what, you know, and that way you're not violating any open meeting law or anything like that. It's just a, another friend who is in the same world as you are, you know, whether you're a, you know, auto mechanic or, or, you know, school committee member or whatever your profession it is, it's nice to have peers that you can bounce ideas off of and, you know, have someone hopefully from the outside, think outside the box a little bit and look into what you have going on and, you know, make sure, you know, hey, you know, I noticed that you guys were doing this. We tried that. This worked better. So. Is there a follow-up meeting or is something scheduled? Yeah, yeah we, uh, we haven't scheduled it yet, but it's going to be uh, mid-January. Um, it's going to be our next meeting, and then we're going to try to schedule early February for, you know, yeah, I think that's going to be the trying to find a time where yeah, we're 20, people 20 people schedules. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. So in 2017, I think, is when it's slated <laughs> for, the, uh, for the joint uh, committee area. So... I think that, that that is going to be the, you know, and obviously we're not going to get all 20, um, but if we can get, you know, a dozen, um, you know, for an evening just to have it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, go out for Chinese and, you know, you know, have some laughs and meet each other and just kind of, you know, not necessarily have an agenda, just kind of talk about some general mm -hmm. things. I think that would be a good first start to continue to move on. Okay. That's it. All right. All Dr. Right. Lardy. Um, Lisa already did her partner presentation. So um, you had asked me at our last school committee meeting about, we talked about the um, building usage rental um, and the issue that we have because we currently don't have a fee for the gym um, and we have outside groups, sport, adult sports groups booking it um, as a backup which prevents access for the rec department. So you would ask me to get some comparative costs from um, Rentham, Plainville and those were all in your packet. Um, they range. Um, depending on the school, uh, Rentham is the first one. They charge for the gymnasium for nonprofit groups um, $20 an hour to hold the gym during the week and then 55 on the weekend. So 55 probably reflects their labor charge for the weekend. Um, 
So you have rent them up first. Plainville, I think, is $15 for the gym rental space. Um, yep, they, it, uh, gymnasium, yes, for um, all groups, $15. Um, for outside nonprofit groups, it's 35 and then King Philip is the last one, and they have for their gymnasium um, the fee is ten dollars, but they charge a thirty dollar labor fee. So it's so it's forty dollars. So is that per hour or is that per uh, per event or? I would have to. I believe that is. I believe that's per event because it doesn't say that it's an hourly rate. Oh no, hourly fee. Hourly, fees. Fees hourly five, fee. Yeah. Yep. So, so $40, $40 an hour. hour. And then they note up at the top right that, that Saturday and Sunday they, they One and a half times increase and two times for the Sunday. labor costs. Okay, okay. Do so they charge the labor per hour as well? Yes. They do. They break it down for labor. Right. Wow. So they charge 40 So if you look at them overall, it, you know. For two hour basketball, you're 80 bucks. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so they're more expensive, whereas rent them is, well, you know, 20 during the week and 50 <laughs> on the weekend. Um, and then King Phillips, uh, um, Plainville's in the middle. So. I would probably recommend to the committee we consider um, at least a $15 rental fee to hold the gymnasium. We don't charge in our policy labor fees during the non -core, um, during the core hours, so that would be during the week. So it would just be $15 during the week. On the weekend, there is a labor charge, so they would be paying for the custodial fee as well. Um, you know, by our current policy, which is more. Uh, more cumbersome. What's our actual utilization now? Is it is this being used often on the weekends? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's I'm just curious how much yeah, basketball, basketball youth basketball, rec department, men's league. So yeah, it's it, there's pretty good usage. The, is this going to personally affect me? No, gonna it's going to personally right. affect. <laughs> the issue that we were trying to prevent I mean, is that <laughs> is that people book our gym because we're the only one in the area that doesn't have a fee, and so they book it with the intention of not using it, knowing that they have a backup location. And then when the rec department tries to schedule things, they can't get access. So yeah, because the way the thing goes now, we go through the rec department for the, the league we play in. On right, the and there's no 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 fee. We pay for that. They charge you the. The rec department charges you maybe the custodial fees? I don't know. We pay something. Charge. It's either five dollars per but, but, or if you sign up for a, a session it's basically for right, right, September to December right, you play. You right pay now it's a hundred percent profit center for the rec. Yeah. Right. Because they're not being charged any fees by the schools. Well done on their part. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And but they're also they are having difficulty booking because there's other groups that will hold the gym space because there's no no cost. Hmm. Okay. But I mean but they would be would they be? Would they fall under? Like I, I, I'm, I think Rentham seems to be the most reasonable, just from the standpoint of its, you know, twenty dollars an hour. It's just, I mean, it seems. I like round numbers, but would that be fall under a government activity? But you know, by you know, since it's the rec department. Well, their categories are a little different than ours right. in our policy, but I, it, that's what I'm, I'm just trying to look to see what rec would fall under on this. In ours, it's not. Here's they would one, be a right? nonprofit. Um, Group and I think that's category. But I wasn't B sure if it would be, you know, adult, be adult sports groups that. You know. yeah, oh, you're comparing. I'm sorry. I would town. say they would be a nonprofit group. The twenty dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. Rec would be a nonprofit group, mm -hmm. even though it's a town. Even though it's a town organization. Because it's not being used for town business. Yes, and in our categories, I think they they've classified the rec. So what if we're doing, if we're using the gym for, an election, that would fall under the town government activity, mm -hmm. okay, as opposed to basketball. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so the so this is, is, are, are, we, are we considering this as an incidental change? Yeah, the, I, I would recommend that you think about you know either ten to fifteen dollars uh, as an hourly fee for the for the gym, and then what, if you're comfortable with that, I'll bring the fee scale for a vote for next week. I just didn't know what you wanted to put in it as a as a placeholder. Yeah. I, 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 I was going to say I'm even fine with twenty. I mean, I, if, I like twenty. If if KP in this in our same town is forty. An hour. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you know, we're half of it. I mean, yeah. and that's, that's we, I was say, we're, we're, I mean, we're, we're talking five bucks here. <laughs> I mean, it's not like. Well, even if you did say, I'm just going by basketball. Basketball's two hours, so forty dollars. Right. Spread amongst however many people is. You have at least ten guys. Eighteen cents a piece. Right. Yeah. It really affects anyone's right. life, so I think twenty is fine. Oh. So you want right. to do? All right. So then I will update the fee schedule and bring it. Um, and and then just and then also factor in our weekend and. The labor's janitor. already in. Okay, so we just okay. don't have a room usage. Okay. Fee. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. 
Um, the other thing in your packet is the school committee has to annually vote to approve the family handbook. Um, so you have a copy of the family handbook. I wanted to highlight just a couple of things within that. There are a few things that we will be changing um, based on some recent changes to um, different laws. So. The this is our family handbook for two, that we're voting right now for 2014-2015. Yes, so I would recommend approving it, and then we this will have to update. Oh, so some we policies. didn't approve this last spring. You did not. Uh, okay. You didn't approve it. Okay. No. All right. So this is already out. <laughs> it's been out for six months. It's on the web. So you need to. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's been updated. You, no. you approved it last year, and the only things that have been changed are contact information. Okay. So you approved this last year. Okay. Um, but we do have a couple of policies because there was changes to legislation for the bullying law right. over the summer. So that policy will be coming to the school committee for a um, to be approved as an incidental change at your next meeting. So we will immediately replace it in the handbook. Um, and then there's also a um, let me just check one other piece. Uh, yeah, so that's the last on page 70. We'll have to add the new reference. Based the, on the, the new bowling. Yes, um, but you have not approved that yet. Um, and then there was one other that... Oh, um, and you just approved the uh, new internet use policy. Um, so right. that will be updated as well. Okay. All right, is there a motion to accept the 2013-2014 family handbook? So moved. Second. Second. Any further... Discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And then the last thing I just wanted to update you on um, the um, status of emergency planning. We did have at our last staff development day a half day professional development workshop for teachers. We brought in an co outside company called Synergy Solutions who practiced um, a revised emergency plan for um, v various different crisis situations. We did practice um, how to respond if you were ever to have a live shooter or critical incident in the school. Um, the value of having Synergy came in, come in was they did the overview presentation, we looked at best practice um, and what we've learned as a community and nation from events that have occurred in the last probably 15 to 20 years. Um, so there are new practices in place. Um, they also brought a team so there were at least 10 different officers. So we practiced drills in classrooms, in hallways, in open settings. Um, and every classroom had an officer in the classroom during the training to provide teachers with feedback, um, ask questions, uh, respond to any concerns that they had. So it was an excellent, excellent training. I think um, very nerve-wracking uh, to have to deal with this topic, but I think teachers felt very empowered at the end of the training that they really had the most current, best information and that we're as prepared as possible if we were ever in a situation that we had to respond to um, a critical incident. So it was great. We did invite um, Rentham, Plainville, KP. Um, we had some reps from Tri-County here that came to just observe the training to determine whether or not it was something they wanted to bring um, back to their systems. And uh, for the most part, pretty much everybody is going to be bringing Synergy back. So it was, it was a really valuable experience. This was last Wednesday? So we last that? Wednesday. We, we did it um, as a practice drill with staff only. So we did it on the release day when kids weren't here. Good. I was going to say, the, the teachers I've talked to about it, they said it was phenomenal. They said, you know, they said it was just you know, completely, you know, by having, you know, as opposed to just doing a regular walkthrough and you're not really paying attention, you're just kind of going through the motions versus doing a you know, much more comprehensive, you know, your adrenaline's going, everything else is, you know, going on. They, they, they were surprised how differently they reacted. You know, a lot of teachers, you know, a couple of teachers I talked to, they said they had different reactions than they expected themselves to have, you know, just from, you know, going, you know, being in the situation. You know, and they're like, well, we've done the drill, you know, 10 times, but very, very different. Very different to do a live scenario. Live scenario. Yeah. What's, uh, I'm sorry if you just said this, and uh, so I apologize. Is there, what would be the follow-up with this? Because obviously there's a lot, there was a lot of good that was gained from this. Would yep. there be something that would We do have follow-up plan. Yes, okay. we will do. We can continue. Now that we've done the overview training, we can do this in-house and practice with the local Norfolk police. Okay. Um, but we do have follow-up plans um, for both staff. We have a Glenn, Officer Glenn Eichel is coming back. After the training, we asked, the principals asked teachers what questions came up in the training, what concerns, new concerns, issues that they, they're thinking about. You look at your environment very differently after you've gone through it. So we knew people would have questions. Um, and they're collecting those questions and thoughts 
spots now. Glenn is coming back to each building um, in January for their staff meeting to respond to, to questions, identify areas in need for further training. Um, and he's actually going to visit individual classrooms at teachers' request to look at their own space um, and make suggestions um, in terms of how to respond given their own location in the different um, things that are available in each classroom. And so this will remain an ongoing, ongoing dialogue. Okay, yep. That was it. That's it. All right. Committee reports. Uh, Nest, uh, Norfolk Elementary School Trust, is um, in the process of its um, second annual fundraiser of doing the uh, T-shirts with Norfolk written on it. Now that we started at Community Day, um, so I think that's there's there was a little glitch in the email that was sent out this week that had the wrong address on, email address on it. So it's being extended until Friday. So that'll be going out again tomorrow with the, with the correct address. So those are $10 each and 100% of the proceeds go to NEST, which funds uh, different grants for teachers and extra, extra programs and academic-based programs um, throughout, the, throughout the school year. Uh, King Philip, Jeff is not here. Um, so I don't know if you have any update on King Philip. King Philip is... Still, 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 our, still our middle school and high school. Okay. Um, <laughs> policy subcommittee. Okay. Mark. Yep. Uh, we've got a few things that are going to be coming forward in the January meeting that are going to be uh, incidental changes. Uh, one of them is going to be for the student costs and fees. Just had to add uh, some new language in there for uh, a change in the law, as well as the uh, bullying prevention. We've got, uh, we had to change some wording in that because of uh, new laws. Um, we're going to have a first reading for uh, cons consideration and critical uh, criteria for approving school partners. Uh, so we're going to be bringing that forward for an initial first reading next month. Uh, we've been working on that for a while. And then uh, the student health. Uh, services and, requ uh, and requirements, managing student life-threatening allergies and other medical conditions. It looks like we're just going to have a couple of incidental changes on that that we're going to bring forward and uh, present to the committee for approval. So, other than, oh, and uh, that actually no, that was the other one for that. And so that's it. Okay. Good um, budget, Kelly. Uh, yeah, this will be very brief. Uh, we actually are meeting after after the school committee meeting today to kind of go over the expense side of the, the budget, the 2014 budget. Um, so next month we should be able to provide the, the committee with the more detailed expense, uh, expected expenses, um, looking into capital expenses and things of that nature. Uh, so we're on track um, to, to have a, you know, the budget in place by same time as we did last year, which is yep. May, May, April, or? Um, I think, I think um, we will probably have it for committee by March. By and March, then, okay. Yeah. Approval. Okay. Do we do the public budget hearing? Is that in March, March as well? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. That's it. All right. Technology subcommittee. Um, you want to, did, um, I know Jeff's not here, but I wasn't sure if uh, Mike, the Mike had told you the tech steering committee. I know that's a little different, but I figured I'd ask you on it anyways. Yeah, the tech steering committee did have their first meeting last week. Um, they are talking about one of the things that we're working on is developing a scope and sequence for the technology skills curriculum um, and expectations by grade level. So they had some dialogue and discussion on that, um, and that's an ongoing project. So um, I think Jeff can uh, update you more, but that's what the focus of the first tech steering committee meeting was. Okay, and building subcommittee, last meeting got canceled, but did you have anything from? Playground's done. Playgirls, yeah. Woo! Oh. Well, mostly. <laughs> except for the net that we're waiting for. So, so waiting for the net. Nets. Are all the gates in yet? Uh, I they believe. weren't as of Friday. Which, which gates? The colonial fence is doing the playground. No, no, that's the, not the, done. No, the, no, the actual the playground gate. The playground still has the, the actual gates. They just had metal. I don't think so because up. I think they're waiting for the net to come in. Oh, okay. You still have to. The, the Burlinger, remember the Burlinger web climber? Go Germany? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, were you there with the suspicion was the one at HOD was actually the one intended for Freeman? Don't just shoot, don't shoot the messenger. It's message. definitely, no, no, it's definitely not. That's, oh, they're, they're. No, because that one at, at Freeman was, I mean, at HOD was on the plans and. It, and it's a different you know, color well, than you guys. It's supported by fact. <laughs> yes. No, well, no, it's the same. Yes, yes, yes our, our, uh, our. The uh, issue is that at the building committee, um, the Fontaine indicated that they were going to have that net in two weeks. 
and then they asked for color choices which there is no way it could come oh, yeah. in two weeks. So right. the net that's that we ordered is a very is a totally different color scheme, the one that's at HOD. And when we ordered that, I um, had to work with a consultant to get them to eat the cost of air shipping it. And the fastest they could get it to us was seven weeks with air shipping. And they absorbed a $2,000 cost for that. Right. So it's definitely not the net that was intended well, for yeah, this, this is This is the net that has been ordered and had in stock for you know, over a year now. And that's there, yeah, it's been sitting there the whole time. And, but yet they hadn't asked us the color yet. So yeah. um, it's just, so that's yet, just yet another case of. Well, did, were you at the November meeting? I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. I have some concerns with that, their confidence with they'll be easily able to find the footings and just install this and... They, they did install footings before they put the surfacing down. Yeah, I understand they yeah. did. I'm <laughs> saying easily finding them is my concern of it's going to just turn into a, another work site by the time they actually get this thing in by the time it shows up. I mean, it's not that yeah. we can do it, we, I guess. We, I could have sworn it was here, Steve. <laughs> that, that, well, I, I agree so with just, you, Just Thomas, ignore that I big hole that, that we put in. Yeah. Because it wasn't put in in the sequence that it would typically be, I think we need to, once they install the net, have the inspector come out and yeah. certify yes. that the net's I, code and I everything. Have a lot Absolutely. Of concerns with them being able to do that. So. Yeah, I, I agree. I have a lot of concerns with them being well, pretty much anything. It's a different thing. All right, and so we, then, actually, I'm sorry. I don't know what I was, Did, was there any final feedback regarding the whole um, loom? Wasn't there a loom summit that was going to go down with Bob? I haven't heard the final. I believe they're waiting for a response on that. Okay, but there um, was. They they did meet to talk about it, and I think they agreed to disagree. And I think they were sending it to arbitration to determine right. who was responsible. But for screening. last I heard, it was arbitration. Yeah. Because it's you know it's one of those things in their contract. They said, well, if you have us do this, it's going to cost. Fifty thousand dollars, and we're like, all right. Since we built it into your contract, even though it's in there, then since you're not going to be doing it now, give us the fifty thousand dollars. And yeah, it went. It was they didn't. They didn't resolve I, I just, it. I'm not really jumping out for the arbitration part, and, and we, we went through this the last time we talked about this because I think essentially no one's going to be happy with that outcome. And I, Probably. but all right, whatever. There's nothing we can do, I guess. This is kind of on the same topic. I got a question about the light that's out in front of HOD that's been laying down for DPW is, is and highway is fixing that. Okay. It's on yep. order. Okay. I was what happened? Been laying yeah. Yeah. Somebody hit it. During the, ice, during that first ice, ice storm. Oh, that Saturday they, one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or whatever or, it was. Yeah. The where they spun, they spun out and just uh, okay. went right through it. What was it a big rig? That thing was like no. twisted. No, like just a, just a regular, regular, regular automobile. Wasn't me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that's it. Uh, new business. Um, we had a CPAC um, application, but we'll have to postpone that till next month because they had the old form um, for that. And then the school partner renewal application for the NTA. Um, and this is cool. If we have any questions, we've got the NTA boss here. So. Um, is there a motion to accept the Norfolk Teachers Association as a school partner? You guys do a lot of stuff with the school, right? <laughs> <laughs> you guys do a couple things with the school? <laughs> no. All right, okay. so moved. Second. Second. Any Second. discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And minutes. Uh, has everyone had a chance to review the minutes from November? Yeah. Any changes? All in favor? Aye. 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 That's staying. Oh, were you not here? Kelly? Oh, that's right. Kelly was not here. Kelly wasn't here. So we don't All right. Perfect. And next school meeting, Tuesday, January 14th. Does that work for everybody? Yes, it does. Well, for me, anyway, I don't know if I can speak for everyone else. That's what I <laughs> Works for me. Tomas. Uh, I'm not getting there. Um, why do I think I have something like that? I'm impressed if you can remember something. No, sir, that, no, that's what I'm, a whole I'm month eight. ahead. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good for me. So that's why I think something actually is going on there. Too. Are we doing policy before that as well? Yep. Okay. I mean, did you guys schedule that? Not. I was waiting to see what date we were doing okay. school committee. All right. I don't have nothing, but for some reason that's stuck in my mind, but okay. Your anniversary? Yeah. Your, uh, um, birthdays? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I don't think it's my own. No, oh, no. Okay. okay. All right, so that's the next meeting. And okay, so I have a motion to go into executive session and we will be not returning to public <laughs> session, but we will be returning some of us to budget subcommittee uh, immediately following s executive session. The motion to go into executive session is to conduct strategy sec sessions in preparation for negotiation with union personnel and to collect collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with the union personnel and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bar bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining, bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares, I so declare, and not to, and we will not convene, reconvene in open session. All in favor, it hits a roll call vote. Mark Flaherty. Kelly Peterson. Thomas Doyle. Sean Dooley. There we go. All right. Thank you very much.